Good afternoon, folks. Welcome back to Advanced Hour Chemistry. In this afternoon's special uh, treat especial, we are going to hopefully talk about these two uh, areas here. That's strong and weak acids and bases, and uh, pH. And in fact, uh, we're going to delve into pH in a lot more detail. What on earth does that mean? Uh, why is it always a capital H? Uh, we will answer these and more exciting questions today. I think, though, we'll start with the difference between strong and weak acids or bases. Right, I, let's have a look at strong and weak acids and bases here. I should have started, of course, with the definition, but I didn't because I'm an idiot. So let's put the definition here straight away. Strong acids and, in fact, strong bases, these have something in common. If you put them into water, they will completely split apart and form ions. So if you put one uh, million molecules of hydrochloric acid, because uh, it is actually a gas originally, uh, into water, then you will end up with one million uh, ions, hydrogen ions, and one million hydroxide and uh, one million chloride ions. Sorry, don't think ahead, hey, you can't, you're not capable of doing that. So that's AQ, and that is AQ2. So that is a one-way arrow, very simple. Same with this. If we put, uh, say, one million sodium hydroxides into water, then you get the pass. By the way, don't shout to me. I know that that's not actually H+, but for the purposes of today, it's close enough. So this will form entirely sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And these are all AQ. These are a Q as well. That, if you're interested, is a solid when it's pure. So, uh, yeah, one way only. All of these end up completely ionized. That is the definition of a strong acid or a strong base. Well, hopefully you can work out that I'm hinting. That means a weak acid only partially ionizes. So what is going on there? I did mean to use a, a pink color for these, by the way. Um, but my pink pen is atrociously scratchy, so it was driving me bonkers. So instead, I'll use something completely independent. Let's use a black so we don't confuse things. I've said here, examples of weak acid would be any carboxylic acid. You'll probably grow very weary of me using this example, but that's not going to stop me because it's nice and easy. CH3, C, double bond, O, O, H, some vinegar, otherwise known as ethanoic acid. Plop that into water. We'll do the proper version this time. Uh, the non-bonded pair of electrons, one of them, can pull this hydrogen off and leave you with H3O, hydronium ions, and ethanoate ions, CH3, C, double bond, O, O minus. And you notice, of course, that this is an equilibrium. So, in fact, not all of these molecules fall apart to release ions. Some of them it's implying are staying as molecules. We'll just find out just exactly how much some of them it is, of course, in the very near future. Because this is an equilibrium, we can have a K value to show you where that equilibrium lies. I'll try and put a link up here somewhere to my equilibrium video, so you can click that if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, and because these are relatively important, they've even got their same, they've got a little subscript, Ka, for acids. Um, so let's have a look at what happens with a weak base. We'll pick ammonia because it's nice and easy. Ammonia molecules, NH3, will react with the water molecules and they will form an equilibrium. We will pull a hydrogen off of this and onto there and you will form NH4 ions and you will form hydroxide ions. So we have released hydrogen ions, H3O, Hydrogen ions, same thing. And we have released hydroxide ions. Technically speaking, we didn't release them. We turned the water into hydroxide ions, actually. Uh, examples here. Strong, uh, your, your standard acids that we've always used before, further down the school. So any mineral acid, as they're called, hydrochloric, sulfuric, nitric, weaks. Well, any and all of the carboxylic acids are weak. Carbonic acid which is formed from carbon dioxide dissolving in water, we'll look at that in more detail later, and sulfurous acid, not sulfuric. Sulfurous is formed from SO3, SO2, sorry, dissolving in water, and this is formed from CO2 dissolving in water. Interestingly, uh, if you've ever been to some of these epic caves underground in England, then that 
they are a result of carbonic acid. The rainfall picks up a little bit of carbon dioxide, it's ever so slightly acidic, and slowly dissolves the, the limestone away under the ground over millions of years. But I'll leave that to the geographers and geologists, because they'll do a better job than me. So that's a fundamental definition, folks. Strong acids and strong bases, 100% ions, no molecules left over. Uh, weak acids and bases, uh, most definitely not 100%. As we can see from these examples here, these are equilibria. So that means you are retaining some, spoiler alert, almost all of the molecules and hardly releasing any ions. That's what defines a weak acid and a weak base. Not the same as dilute. Very much not the same as dilute. Apologies for reusing the other side of this sheet. I'm trying to save the trees. Sorry about the ink. You could have, for example, 10 moles per litre of hydrochloric acid. You could compare that to 10 moles per litre of ethanoic acid. This is a strong acid. And that is a seriously concentrated solution. This is a weak acid but an equally concentrated solution. Weirdly enough, and you could, of course, let's go with the base option, you could have 0 0.00001 moles per litre of sodium hydroxide, and you could have the same concentration of ammonia solution. In this case, amusingly, we're dealing with a strong base, but a dilute solution, and we're dealing with a weak base and a dilute solution. Okay, let's get some fresh paper. Let's take a look again at this equilibrium constant for an acid, Ka. Let's look at it from the point of view of the equation. Um, the equation I had on the other page was CH3COOH. Just ignore the gentle blues in the background. It's my son just jamming on his guitar. Um, probably more interesting than listening to me. Uh, we've got um, the equilibrium is going like that, and we're creating a thanoate ions and a hydronium ions. Now, equilibrium constants, everything on the right over everything on the left raised to their powers. So you would, at first glance, expect this to be perhaps, oh, exciting times again, we get to use the square brackets. Just to remind you, they mean concentrations in moles per litre. Times this concentration of H3O all over the concentration of this. Uh, no, I haven't lost my remaining marbles and forgot to put the water in. Remember, pure liquids don't get to play when it comes to equilibrium constants. So that is the expression for the acid dissociation constant um, for this particular acid, ethanoic acid. On page 14 of your data books, we actually have a whole load of weak acids and the actual numerical value of their dissociation constant. So if we flick back to my vinegar obsession for a second, ethanoic acid, they'll even give you the equation here, in case you're fuzzy on it. Goodness knows why, to be honest. Um, the number here is 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5 that I've just drawn over because I'm an idiot. That's the Ka for this. 1.7 times 10 to the minus 5? That k is seriously less than 1, which means that there are many, many more times, in fact, nearly, what, 170,000 times more molecules than ions released. So, in fact, <laughs> yeah, it's a good name for them, weak acids. Um, they can get seriously weaker than that. Just a quick glance down here, showing concentrations down at minus 19 um, sorry, not concentrations, I apologise, showing K values down at minus 19. And we're also getting K values coming, what's the largest here? To the minus 2 for sulfurous acid. Uh, so you can calculate a K, uh, A for these, K, A, dissociation constant of the acids, and they are shown on page 14 of your data book. We'll come back to 14 when we have a look at indicators in a couple of videos' times. A couple of videos' times? Sorry. Forgotten how to speak. Okay, 
Just before we go on to a slight variation in the definition of an acid and a base, we'll have a look at four different properties here, comparing the same concentration of a strong acid to a weak acid. Uh, you may choose to pause the video, of course, and try and predict uh, what's going to go on here. Um, but if you don't, no problem. I'm going to give you the answers anyway. Nothing you can do to stop me. Rate of reaction. Well, let's just call this fast for simplicity. Because this acid here is a strong acid, so all of these ions are all simultaneously released into the, uh, into the solution. And they're all available to react, so there are tons of them around, so the reaction is fast. This, of course, is a weak acid, like I said, so these are only partially released all at once. So therefore, there's less of them around, so the reaction is slower. Conductivity, again, we're going to dumb this down a bit. We're simply going to say high, because there's lots of ions around. And you guessed it, low, because there aren't lots of ions around. Ions? Um, pH. I'm going to consult my crystal ball of pH, and I'm going to come to the conclusion that the pH of this is 1. By the end of the video, I'm hoping you will know how exactly how I was able to know that. This we will also calculate, I think it's 4 and a bit, but I'm not entirely sure. Between 3 and 4. Let's hedge my bets. Simply because the concentration of the hydrogen ions is lower. Now, here's the one that blows everybody's minds, because... If we have got 10 millilitres of the acid, Z, both of the acids, they're equal concentrations, equal volumes, and they're also what's called um, monoprotics. In other words, they only release one hydrogen ion from each of these acids. You can compare sulfuric with this, because sulfuric releases two moles of hydrogen ions. Now, if this concentration is the same as this concentration, and it's a one-to-one -one reaction, then if you've got 10 mils of the acid, you're going to need 10 mils of the alkali. And you're all going, yeah. Now here's the slightly odd one. You still require 10 mils of the alkali to neutralize this. Why? Well, you've still got the same number of moles of hydrogen ions eventually available. It's just that most of them are at any one point in time tied up as part of the molecule. But the ones that do get released, ignore the beeping, sorry, it's just my printer shutting itself off. The hydrogen ions that do get released are then snapped up by the hydroxides that are floating around. They disappear off, hand in hand, form water. And this hydrogen ion here cannot go back again to form moleculars. Moleculars to form molecules, sorry. But this reaction here, this can release another hydrogen ion, which gets snapped up by the nearest hydroxide. And eventually, all of your molecules have gone, and they have released all of their hydrogen ions, which is the same total number of hydrogen ions in the end. It's just that the reaction happens a bit slower. So that's why you still need 10 mils of alkali to neutralize it. A little bit of a twister for the mind, that one. Uh, and a favorite trick SQA question in the multiple choice. Okay, uh, these are called the Bronsted-Lowry definitions of an acid and a base. Can I get Mr. Bronsted or Mrs. Bronsted, whoever it was? It's name right. Bronsted, there we go. It's German, so it's got that weird... I don't even know what that's called. I'm terribly ignorant, sorry. Bronsted-Lowry definitions of an acid and a base. So an acid is something that gives out protons, and a base is something that receives or accepts protons. Pretty much what we sort of explained in National 5, there's nothing really new there. Um, we can take a quick look at, uh, once again, I'm sorry, <laughs> massive lack of imagination. Let's do this one here. Um, so remember, the, the lone pair of electrons is stealing this hydrogen, and the pair of electrons that's in this bond is collapsing back down onto there. So we end up forming... L bond O, O minus, and H3O plus. Uh, if you look at this, this molecule here it has donated this hydrogen ion over onto the water molecule, in fact. So, of course, this is an acid. Interestingly, you might realise that the water here is behaving like a base. Not what you think of as a base, but this is definitely an acid, that's for sure. 
Um, and if we look at the other example, let's look at ammonia as a weak base. So I sort of skimmed over it last time because I was being lazy, but let's do the proper version involving the lone pair of electrons. And here's my water molecule. So this bond collapses down onto here, and this forms a new bond onto there. And we create NH4, the plus charge, and hydroxide ions. Uh, now in this case, this ammonia molecule is accepting this hydrogen ion, so yep, it's behaving like a base, absolutely. Although again, fascinatingly, look what the water's doing. This water molecule is actually donating a hydrogen this time around. So we've got a new word to throw at you, a new word to describe something which has got the properties of both an acid, like it's behaving here, and a base, like it's behaving here. Um, the word for that is amphoteric. So water is described as an amphoteric molecule, that's an M, sorry. And it can behave like a base, and it can behave like an acid. Interesting, very versatile molecule, which is nice for all life on Earth. Sorry about that, I was going to go on to something else here, but I've totally forgotten. I need to finish off something else. We're obsessed with looking at reactions from left to right, because that's how we normally consider them. And we tend to forget that, of course, that is an equally valid direction to look at it at. So if we look at what's happening here to here, we can see that the thanoate ion is actually accepting a hydrogen ion from this and turning itself into this. So if you're looking at it from right to left, then this is actually acting like a base. But you can't just call it a base base um, because that's going to confuse everything. So we invented a term to describe the reverse of equilibria and we call it a conjugate base. So this here is behaving as what's called a conjugate base. Basically, <laughs> sorry about that, had to be done. It's the counter ion of the acid, effectively. This, this only applies, of course, to equilibria. It doesn't apply to strong acids and strong bases. So it only applies to equilibria. So if you're going that way, then we have the conjugate base. And I'm hoping that you can anticipate what I'm going to say about this ion here. Because if we look at this going in that, that direction, then the ammonium ion is shedding a hydrogen ion, it's discarding one, which means it's behaving like a conjugate acid. Grant, have we covered everything I wanted to? Let me just check so I can go on to talk about pH and how you calculate it. The quick answer to that is yes, we have it. I'm losing the light here. This is what happens when you film halfway through November in the Highlands of Scotland. You've got five minutes and then the sun goes down. Let's have a look at pH just before we lose the light then. Um, pH, what is going on there? Uh, let's do pH, first of all, of strong acids because that is the easiest one to calculate. Um, P actually means negative log of something. And H is actually the concentration of of the hydrogen ions or hydronium ions, same thing, in moles per litre. So we get to do the negative logarithm of the concentration of the hydrogen ions. By the way, that's log to the base 10, which I'm not going to write every time because life is way too short. Not these weird natural logs. I don't understand them. I'll leave them to the maths department. So what? Well, let me pause this. I'll draw a table out and you'll see. Right, what I've got here is I've got a table of concentration of hydrogen ions in moles per litre. I've just flicked it into scientific notation. Why have I bothered doing that? Because if you're dealing with one here, and if it's log to the base 10, then the log of that number there is simply the power, which would give you a pH of, oops, negative one. That's why we have negative of the log. So the pH ends up becoming positive one. This one here will be positive two, positive three, you get the idea. Positive 4, positive 5. Lovely. So that is how we calculate pH for strong acids. If you know the concentration of the hydrogen ions, all you need to do is take the log of it and then invert the sign of the answer that you get. If you're dealing with something weirder like 3 times 10 to the negative 3, you can't simply do it in your head. You're going to need a calculator for that. I may go and steal my son's calculator for that, actually. Um, just before we do that, though, why did I start at 0.1 moles per litre? Because you can quite happily get one mole per litre. 
Yes, you can. Do you want to anticipate the pH number of that? We can show that as that, which means the pH of that is actually zero. So yes, you can get a pH of zero. And as Duncan in my advanced higher class speculated, what happens if you have got 10 moles per litre, which you can get? It's pretty, you don't have one that anywhere near your hands, but you can get it. That is now one times 10 to the plus one, which means <laughs> pH can indeed be negative one. Why can't you get negative two pH? Simply because that would require 100 moles per litre of concentration and you can't simply physically dissolve that much acid in the water. So that is how you calculate pH. Just before we leave, can I point out that in order to change the pH of a solution by just one click on the scale, you would need to actually dilute it by a factor of 10, sorry, divided by 10. So to change by two clicks, you'd have to divide it by a factor of 100. So you need to dilute something 100 times in order to change the pH unit by just two clicks. pH is logarithmic, and now we can see why. Okay, um, so let's have a look at this one. In fact, what if we had that? I would punch in 3 to the power of negative 3. Uh, and then I want the log of that. I don't know why I punched that in. Sorry, I want log of the answer. I'm not used to these high-tech calculators. Uh, and then that's negative 2.52. And of course, we flip that and it becomes positive 2.52. All right, uh, one more thing before we leave this. This is all fine and dandy, but what happens if a question told you this? The concentration of sodium hydroxide. So we have sodium hydroxide. Its concentration is, I don't know, say, um, 0.02 moles per litre. What's the pH? Now we have a problem here because we know the concentration of OHs. But that's not what we want to know. We want to know the concentration of Hs. Fortunately, our old friend, the water equilibrium, Kw, is going to come to our rescue because it tells us that the concentration of hydrogen ions times the concentration of hydroxide ions equals a constant number which at 25 is that. So we know that because it's a constant. We know that because the question told us what it was. All we need to do is solve for that and then calculate the negative log of that answer. So that means concentration of hydrogen ions would be equal to 1 times 10 to the minus 14 over 0 0.02. Let's do that. Um, 1 to the negative 14 over 0 0.02. That would give us 5 to the negative 13. And then um, we take the log of that and then flip the sign on it. So it's log of the answer, which is negative 12.3, which of course becomes 12.3, which uh, as a quick sanity check sounds perfect for a solution of alkali. The very last thing in our epic tale today, guys, is how you calculate the pH of a weak acid. Now, uh, we're on pH again, but this time it is option number two, weak acids. Now, their problem is that all the hydrogen ions are not being released all at once. Remember, if you're paying attention to the start of the video, you'll know that. Now, the good news is, on your formula page on the back of your data book, there is, sorry, in the front of your data book, I apologize, there is a way to calculate the pH of weak acids. It's uh, half, pKa minus a half log of C. What's going on here? Well, that is the concentration of your weak acid uh, in moles per litre, of course. And this pKa, we know what a Ka is. pKa, like before, is just negative log of the Ka value. Remember the data book page? I didn't mention at the time, but they've got the Ka and they've also got the pKa worked out for you. You don't even need to work that one out. Wonderful. And what a stroke of luck. pKa is 4.76 for ethanoic acid. I'm going to take a very quick revisit to my table of properties. ta -da. Now, let's actually use this equation here. Bring it down to camera, hey? Pretend you're a semi-professional at this. Let's use this equation here to actually calculate the pH of 0.1 moles per litre vinegar. Uh, so we need a half 
pKa, which is a half times 4.76, minus a half of the log of, what's the concentration? 0 0.1. Okay, well, let's actually do that, and we'll see how close my guess of between 3 and 4 was in that sheet. Might end up looking like a spanner, which is quite possible. Uh, so 0 0.5 times 4.76. That is 2.38. Take away a half of, well, 0 0.1 log. Uh, log of 0.1. I don't know if I'm even doing that. It's negative 1. So that's a half of negative 1. Which is negative negative a half, which is plus a half, of course. So that's 2.38 uh, plus 0.5, which in my head comes out to be 2.88. So I was a little bit off, but I wasn't too far away. That's how you calculate the pH of weak acids. And I think that's actually us done. Let me just check. Oh, is, have I missed anything out? The nature of pH. Was there something I wanted to talk about pH? One last one to do with pH. I want to show you something really quite geeky, but it's really quite cool as well, which is exactly why the pH 7 is neutral. Um... Let me show you something for a second here, guys. Do you remember when we told you at National 5 that the definition of a neutral solution, we told you that it was when you had equal concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide ions. We didn't tell you that it was 7. That's because telling somebody that a pH is 7 is neutral is a terrible definition. This is actually buying on the truth. Now, if we look at our water equilibrium, flip back to our last video for a second, concentration of hydrogen times concentration of hydroxide, whoops, equals 1 times 10 to the minus 14. That is true for 25 Celsius, um, or 298 Kelvin, as we'll come to in the thermodynamics section. Now, this number and this number are equal to each other, which means they're identical, and if you're multiplying the same number by itself, that is the same as saying this. Okay, now if you want to calculate what pH that happens at, we need to know the concentration of the hydrogen ions. This is currently squared. So let's square root that. That will get rid of that. And let's square root that. And it turns out that the concentration of hydrogen ions at a neutral solution, or in a neutral solution, is 1 times 10 to the, you can probably work it out yourself if you're decent at maths, minus 7. Which means, of course, wonderfully, elegantly, that is why the pH of a neutral solution is 7. That is only true at a specific temperature. And in fact, neutral pH will vary because of all this equilibrium nonsense. And in fact, equilibrium light underlies all these different concepts. We've got two more consequences of equilibria left, folks. We've got the pH of salts and we've got... Uh, sorry, three left. We've got pH of salts, we've got buffers, and we've got how the black magic of pH indicators work. How do they manage to change colour at different pHs? But not for this video. That's the end of the game. Thank you for listening very much. Uh, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.